thanks, Zuma. And I'd say maybe the in follow-up to the rotavirus, if a baby got exposed to vetalizumab, that would be the last baby I would give rotavirus to, Joel, just given it's GI specific. So maybe TNF is not as big a deal, but a gut-targeted biologic may not be the best patient to give rotavirus, right? So I was thinking, you know, maybe that's, of all the biologics, it's probably the one not to give rota. Okay, so um, my topic is really going to be talking about treating beyond just symptoms and focusing specific on what are some of the tools that are out there with a focus on fecal calprotectin, since that's probably the marker that we have the most interesting data on in terms of predicting flare, um, both in the disease state and the post-op state. And what I also want to just be clear about is as we move away from symptom-based reactive care to a objective, proactive-based clinical care pathway, the question is, how good are these tools that we're saying should be used to help us guide um, how our patients are doing without asking them how they're doing, in a sense? Because uh, asking may not match what's actually going on in the inside. Uma kind of referred to that in the concept of pregnancy, whether or not we should be monitoring fecal calprotectin. And maybe when a woman says, I'm ready, I'm feeling well to get pregnant, and you, that would be a time to do a calprotectin to kind of say, you know what, you're not quite ready to get pregnant and we should optimize your therapy. So there's ways to start already thinking about objectively assessing disease states and bringing in the pregnancy question about calprotectin. So the concept of disease monitoring is really a periodic measurement that guides the management of a chronic or recurrent condition. And it can be done both the patient uh, and the physician, but um, most, I think the most effective care that you're going to have is if you engage your patient in the concept of wanting to know what's going on on the inside so that I can make sure that I stay well for a durable time period. So this is about re-engaging patients in the conversation of how active your disease is on the inside, because all of us are so focused on this concept of healing, targeting the mucosa, and because unlike rheumatology where they have an x-ray, they can just do an x-ray of the joint or the bone, whatever the, what we're trying to target, it's a little bit more complicated for us to be able to look all the time at our target, which is the, which is the mucosa, particularly for Crohn's disease. You see it's a little bit easier, maybe a flex sig, you can get a better visualization, understanding of what's going on in the mucosa. And monitoring can happen during different phases. We've got the induction phase typically for our treatments, all treatments, the induction into a remission state, and then the ability to sustain that remission state over time. And for me, monitoring is especially important in those patients who are in that maintenance phase, who are claiming I am well, or who want to know if they're responding to therapy during the maintenance phase so that they don't fall out of flare. I think that's really what our job is going to become is how I think all of us are extremely good at people putting people into a controlled disease state. We've got steroids, we've got good therapy, induction therapies. But the art really in the IBD management is the maintenance phase. Now, if we talk about disease-specific targets and keeping a tight control over that target, the diabetics finally have told us that if you target a hemoglobin A1C level of 7, you actually change mortality outcomes. So this was published in t just in 2015. The idea that their big study has actually shown that if you have tight control over a diabetic patient, defining your marker of target, which is the hemoglobin A1C, you actually had a prolonged life outcome. So definition, um, I think they got this from Wikipedia, <laughs> my favorite. Um, a treat-to-target approach, which is really bringing in the concept of tight control, because everyone talks about tight control and treat to target, they're actually melded into a very similar understanding of what we're trying to achieve, which is one where there's limited, in a limited time period to adjust treatment, to reach a predefined target outcome. What is our target? Is it um, thinking about inflammation only? In the rheumatoid arthritis literature, their target is abrogation of inflammation is the most important means to achieve uh, good quality of life, prevent structural damage, and normalize function. That's their target. So they've got a very defined target of what they want to achieve. And they believe that if you check 
for inflammation on a regular basis, and they use three months. So their goal is every 12 weeks you are assessing for inflammation so you can achieve your final target. That's kind of what we are ultimately want to do as well, right? We want to maximize the quality of life and control symptoms. We want to prevent progressive structural damage, meaning fibrostenosis, perforating complication, and we want to mi minimize disability. We really want to optimize the ability of function of an IVD patient. So we have very similar targets for these chronic inflammatory conditions. The question is our target, how are we going to monitor it, and what are the tools we should Im uh, put into our clinical practice to try and keep these patients on the trail to actually achieving these outcomes and staying there. The question and the issue at hand is really what's the target, how do we measure it, how often is it cost efficient or effective to actually try and achieve this target and push, push, push therapy to achieve the target. Can we predict it? And does achieving the target actually translate to improve long-term outcomes? I think that bottom piece is, um, we had a very long discussion yesterday with um, Miguel and Dave was there and talking about how do you translate what we see in a clinical trial, for example, into a five-year outcome, right? That's really what we want to know is that when we achieve an endpoint as predefined in any trial, albeit exciting or not, does it translate in a cost-wise? Do we keep people on long-term biologics just because we believe that that improves the long-term natural history? And is that cost efficient? And how many patients do you need to treat to actually achieve that outcome? So I think that's really where also talked about, you know, how ACOs and payers would view how many patients you would need to achieve an outcome. So the recently um, presented, it was a year ago already, but it's probably one of our most uh, talked about tight control arm study. This was um, driven by Robarts, uh, Brian Fagan and colleagues where they actually took a whole bunch of practices and they randomized patients within practices essentially to either do a standard of care, this is where you are activity wise, I'm gonna treat you like this, come back when you're symptomatic, just like what we do in our, in our practice. So that's the comparative group. Then within the active um, group, they actually took patients uh, focus on just the concept of, it's a very busy slide, but I want to just uh, elaborate on the concept of what it meant to be tight control. Essentially, all patients got steroids. Four weeks later, they were assessed. If you're in remission, great, go on your merry way. If you're not in remission, you're getting combination therapy with adalimumab and either azathioprine or methotrexate. Three months later to the day, you are reevaluated for inflammation. If you have inflammation, you go to weekly adalimumab plus the immunomodulator that they were on. 12 weeks later, reassessed. You're still not doing well. I'm going to switch you from methotrexate to aza if you were on metho, from aza to methotrexate if you were on, if you were on aza. You know, whatever, meth, whatever immunomodulator you were on, you were switched. I'm not sure that was just like, well, how do I get to a year probably because I'm not sure whether or not that's actually what you would do in that case. And then, um, then you would be able to, if you weren't responsive after that, you could switch to another anti-TNF therapy. And three months later, you were reassessed. And if you were failing all that, you could be offered surgery or probably another target, whatever ended up being this trial was designed before other targets were approved. Now, interestingly enough, the outcome that they chose was the Harvey Bradshaw. The reason why I set the stage of this discussion with that topic is that when you use clinical symptom activity indices to determine whether tight control is impactful on outcomes, versus just letting them come in when they're well or when they're sick and just go on your re regular conventional. What I want to show you is that there was no difference across the board in terms of outcomes with, as it relates to the Harvey Bradshaw Index and no steroids, whether you came back when you were sick and I just up to you when you were not well versus keeping you in a very tight control arm of every three months and I'm escalating. But what was impressive is that when you look at hard outcomes like objective measures, there was a p-value significant difference between hospitalizations and complications uh, as it relates to being in a tight control where I know exactly what you're doing and being able to escalate you based on being sick versus letting you come back when you are sick, right? Meaning that idea of tight control. It showed that there was a delta of about 7-8%. Now, what I'll show you at the end of the talk is 
which will relate to why symptom-based assessment is probably only a very small part of the story if you're going to keep someone in tight control. Because that means you're allowing a patient to flare and acting reactively, right? So you're waiting for patients to flare. The concept of using an objective measure may help us have a much better separation of these lines. Because if I could have done a scope and multiple objective other measures and be able to treat you based on objective measures, I probably could have probably prevented complications, hopefully in up to 50% instead of 34, right? So the, I mean, instead of 27, a delta, sorry, of about 50%. That would be the ultimate goal is to say, we have a way of preventing you from having a complication and it goes beyond whether you have abdominal pain or diarrhea, right? That, that's really the concept of what we're gonna get into now. The reason why I state that it's irrelevant in a sense whether you have con uh, diarrhea or abdominal pain as measured by a Crohn's disease activity index is that if you looked at patients from the SONIC trial who had a CDAI remission score, close to four, over 40% of patients did not have mucosal healing. So there was a disconnect in about 40% of patients where they were clinically in remission, but endoscopically they would have not met their outcome of, of disease remission if we would use objective measures. And the converse is in patients who say, I'm very active, close to 30% had zero ulcerations at the time of the endoscopy, so irritable bowel syndrome. And there's a recent reports where they use the CDAI in IBS patients, and essentially patients would have entered the study with IBS based on the CDAI. So in Europe, they're still obsessed with the CDAI, and if you're following the gossip, the FDA is not so into the CDAI and wants us probably to just use abdominal pain and diarrhea for Crohn's disease and number of bowel movements, sorry, and rectal bleeding in UC only, plus an endoscopy score of whatever, an improvement and or zero. So there's going to be a very clear separation of... Um, objective from subjective, and I think Sonic kind of was part of the driver behind all of this. Um, we also know this interesting concept that finally um, Dave Binion will get, uh, it was presented in 2013, it's finally going to be published in the IBD journal, this whole idea of silent Crohn's disease. It's kind of like the post-op state, silent Crohn's disease. You know, you remove a segment, how do you follow them? Uh, you wait for a patient to clinically flare. Do you measure them endoscopically? And maybe the post-op folks will tell us a little bit about that. But Dave Binion introduced the concept. Even if a patient says they feel great by way of a um, simplified inflammatory bowel disease quality of life indicator score, but they had a CRP elevation, and you follow these patients over time. These are patients who claim they're doing extremely well but have an objective measure of inflammation that 37% of those with CRP elevation were hospitalized versus 7% who didn't have a CRP elevation. And what I understand, Miguel, correct me if I'm wrong, but those 37%, not an insignificant amount, were for surgery. So that means these patients felt great, show up, need hospitalization, bowel obstruction, perf or not, needing surgery. So here's an objective marker in a patient who says they feel well. So think about that concept of are there ways beyond just asking my patient how they feel to measure disease activity. We'll enter into the notion of CalProtect and just walk you through kind of the uh, what's, what's out there in CalPro just to a lot of people want to know, well, is there a CalPro cut point? How do I define what's an impressive or important CalProtect? And very few studies have actually correlated specifically a CalPro with mild, moderate, or inactive disease um, endoscopically or even clinically. This was a study that was published back in 2010 suggesting that along the way you may be able to use these numbers numbers to say, okay, if you're above 400, you've got more of a moderate disease activity, above 700, probably more severe disease or high disease activity. And if you're below 250, you're probably mild and probably I don't have to do much about it. In terms of the post-op though, there may be a different threshold for which we accept in the post-op state. So I'll show you that in a moment. In terms of why these markers are important, probably one of the best studies that have told us how well it is at predicting disease flare is there was the STORY study, which as a study itself was taking patients who were on combination therapy and removing the anti-TNF and leaving them on their baseline immunomodulator. And about 
50, let's say 50-50 chance that you stayed off a biologic out to about two years, and they actually were measuring in those patients after they removed the biologic, they measured calprotectin and CRP, and what I thought was interesting in the study is that they actually showed that up to four months pre prior to flare, patients manifested an ele elevation in their CRP and their calprotectin up to four months before clinical symptoms. So the question is, what do we follow? Do we wait for patients to flare? Do we be proactive? Do we act on that uh, calpro elevation? Does it mean we need to just rescope them, or is it a measure that we need to reevaluate them? Is it 100% predictive that a patient has clinical uh, endoscopic disease activity? That, again, needs to be flushed out, but the introduction of the concept that we may be able to predict or use these markers as a way of prompting us to look further and not allow a patient to actually drift off. You know, think about yourself, you're driving your patient, you're trying to keep them in a lane, you start to disease drift, meaning drift off to the side of the road. If you end up on the side of the road, it's too late, the patient's flared. But here you have the ability to drive the patient back into their straight line of staying in a disease remission state by just clinical remission, by being aware of these objective measures and bringing them back to baseline. So at DDW, there was a few studies looking at calprotectin predicting relapse in patients durably in remission on uh, adalimumab, showing that the calprotectin level was significantly higher in patients who relapsed versus those who didn't. And it's interesting, the, um, the cut point for these patients was 204, which actually matched kind of that mild uh, version of the, gra of the table I showed you before, showing that patients clinically, again, using Harvey Bradshaw um, to define remission, but again, that notion of what are we using to actually define relapse and remission is a whole other story, which is why the CD I mean, the FDA is taking on this idea that symptoms alone are not going to bring drugs to market. This was recently is uh, available on Gastro, in published in Gastro and uh, EPUB ahead of print. This is the poker study, which um, I'm sure will be discussed. I'm not going to get into this. is just adalimumab in the post-op prevention study. Um, but the point was they published their CalPro data, and they actually showed that a calprotectin at a cutoff of 100 was predictive of what you would see at your six-month endoscopy. Um, and what was interesting is that they showed that, or their version of the ability of CalPro to predict what you would see, they actually made the declaration that the CalPro was so good that in about 40% of patients, you could have not needed to do your six-month endoscopy because it basically predicted what you were going to see already. So the question is, are we, how do we use CalPro in the post-op? A lot of us are using it three months after surgery, an inpatient who may or may not be on therapy post-op, reassessing them early, seeing if they start to have a CalPro elevation, and then acting upon that, either bringing them in early for your scope. Some may not scope. I don't know what people's strategies are, but we're proposing that everyone should have a six-month endoscopy post-op and using CalPro to guide you who to bring in earlier. Fecal CalPro in a pediatric cohort was interesting. They actually showed that the delta CalPro, meaning the change in calprotectin after induction therapy, be, therapy with infliximab, predicted whether a patient was going to still be on infliximab at a year. The notion that if you don't have a significant change in CalPro, that you actually dropped off and were not considered to be a responder and needed to switch therapies out to a year. And if your CalPro was still greater than 400 at week Week six, meaning just at, after induction with infliximab, you had a lower likelihood of being on drug at a year. So the concept, if you're not getting mucosal integrity change early with these drugs, you may actually need to be thinking about optimizing early. So again, it's about patients will feel better, but are they really endoscopically or mucosally going in the right direction? And should we be using objective measures to determine whether we should optimize drug? And I'll leave that to Uma and Fernando to debate uh, the role of therapeutic drug monitoring. I took that part out of my talk. And so where is the direction going? As I showed you the REACT trial, which is the trial which used symptoms to tell my doctor to escalate my therapy. Well, the Europeans and John Fred Colombell in particular are saying symptoms are really not the direction we need to go. So they designed the COM study. And this is using, instead of symptoms to decide whether or not a patient actually needs to be escalated, they're actually using CRP and fecal calprotectin to determine whether or not you should be escalated. So I'm 
I'm hoping, that, again, that separation of line is actually going to be bigger such that tight control really does prevent complications much more than just at waiting for a patient to come in with a flare, and even more so than using tight control based on symptoms alone. Because patients may say they feel great, don't get escalated, but their CalPER or their CRP was still really high, and we would have not escalated that patient based on symptoms alone. So in summary, why treat beyond symptoms? We believe that objective measures more closely correlate with mucosal inflammation. Objective measures predict disease flare. Monitoring can minimize disease drift, keep patients in their lane. Disease and drug monitoring can predict treatment response. And tight control of patients can result in better outcomes. Thank you very much.